Thank you, everybody, for having me here. Uh, my name is Jeff Lin. I am uh, co-founder and CEO of Cedars. We are an equity crowdfunding platform. Uh, we allow people to invest uh, in seed stage businesses uh, for anywhere from 10 pounds to the full amount the business is seeking. Uh, and we allow startups to raise capital from friends, family, angels, and the crowds. Uh, we launched just under a year ago. We've done 26 deals to date, a million eight uh, invested through the platform. We've seen, we just calculated our numbers the other day and we've done 70% quarter on quarter growth. It has all been going fantastic. It's early days, um, but we have uh, become one of the leading equity crowdfunding platforms in the world and we're very proud of it. Uh, but I'm, I'm not actually gonna talk very much about Cedars today. Uh, I wanna, these conferences and, and these discussions often look forward, which is important, but I'm gonna do something a little unusual and look backward uh, and talk a little bit about history uh, of, of the dem democratization of finance. Because one of the things that we have found ever since we started working on Cedars back in 2009 uh, is a wall of skepticism uh, from many established players, not all, but many established players around the whole concept. And the, the line goes like this. Ordinary people shouldn't invest in startups. It is a bad thing for them. They can't possibly understand the risks that are involved in the asset class. They can't possibly understand what's involved in investing and making investment decisions around startups. Um, and, and one of my personal favorites that often comes from sort of retirees or members of angel networks and sit at golf clubs, you know, we, we are smart money. Uh, the city bankers and lawyers and other sorts of people on the street are dumb money. Um, well, I think we've so far done a pretty good job of proving them wrong. I should say of the startups we funded, uh, we've had them go on to top rate accelerator programs, raise top rate venture capital, release amazing products, do amazing things. The whole model is working. Um, but it shouldn't be a surprise if you look at history that the model is working because financial services is filled or it represents a long tradition of an established elite saying a particular asset class wasn't right for the ordinary man and woman and somebody coming in and disproving that. And so I want to spend this morning talking about three groups of people uh, over the course of the past 110 years and just a little bit about what they did and what their experiences were. Um, and I'm going to start at the turn of the last century with a man named Amadeo Giannini. Uh, he was uh, the son of Italian immigrants to San Francisco. They had gone to uh, California to prospect, the father, his father had gone to California to prospect for gold in the 1850s. Hadn't found a tremendous amount of gold, uh, but had become part of a community of hardworking Italian immigrants uh, who were completely and totally unserved by banks. It's very, very hard, I think, to, real, to, even, to be able to think about this with a straight face today. Um, but at the time, it was seen that bank deposits were not something that was right for the ordinary person. The ordinary worker should take his or her paycheck and presumably put the cash under the mattress. Banking was for the rich. Uh, Giannini didn't like this very much. He thought that this was uh, uh, unfair. And most importantly, he saw a huge target market of his fellow Italian immigrants and, and, and other hardworking people whom he could serve. And in 1904, he opened up what would become the Bank of America. Uh, and it started very nicely, and people started coming, and the whole model worked. Uh, but then, as these things sometimes happen in history, there was one of those cataclysmic moments. Two years after he opened, San Francisco was destroyed by an earthquake. And as a result, you had the entire city, uh, everybody there needing to rebuild, or almost everybody there needing to rebuild and rebuild quickly. And the people most in need of, of cash to be able to rebuild their homes and rebuild their lives were the hard-working people who didn't have a tremendous amount in the way of savings. So Giannini's office, the One Bank of America branch, uh, was, was pretty well destroyed as well. But he, he set up a, a, a desk with two barrels and a few planks. Uh, and he started inviting all of his depositors in uh, and lending to them uh, on the back of a handshake, uh, saying that he, would, uh, he wanted to see them rebuild. He wanted to be able to give them the capital. He'd also done something smart, which was to move all of his deposits out, outside of San Francisco so they were easily accessible to loan out. Um, but he started lending to everybody. Well, what happened to those loans? Every single one of them got paid back in full. Bank of America went on to become one of the most important and prominent banks in the United States. And it wasn't just the lenders who were, and it wasn't just the depositors uh, who were served well by this. 
What wound up happening is other banks caught on pretty quickly and started saying, you know what, maybe serving the ordinary man isn't that bad of an idea. The deposit base in America, uh, and eventually worldwide, was increased significantly, which made available more funding for lending to projects and, other bi and businesses, which helped fuel the growth of the Western economy. That's the early history of banking and how democratization of it completely changed how we understand deposit bases and what's an appropriate asset class for an ordinary person. I'm going to move forward about 40 years, end of the Second World War, uh, 1940s. And, and I appreciate, but I should caveat this by saying, appreciate there's a slight American slant to this. A lot of the early history of financial innovation was American. Today, I happen to think that the most exciting financial innovation in the world is going on in London. But this is history, and this was, this was where things were. Mid-1940s, the stock market, bond markets, were very much something of the elite. They were run by a sort of clubby, uh, old-school Wall Street group uh, that didn't really look tremendously different from what it would have looked like 100 years before. Uh, and to the ordinary person, he, now, he or she now had bank deposits. Everybody could put their money in the bank. But there was no place to put their money to help it grow. Now, enter a guy called Charlie Merrill. Um, Charlie's an interesting guy. He was very much part of that Wall Street clubby elite. He, he, he had uh, uh, gone to Wall Street about 1910, had been a very, very successful merchant banker in the years after the First World War, uh, and had accumulated a tremendous amount of money. And in the process, had founded a firm called Merrill Lynch, which in its first few decades was very much a firm focused on uh, uh, merchant banking, high-level corporate finance. Well, the only difference with Charlie is that his personal background was a little bit different. Uh, he was the son, unlike, he wasn't, most bankers in those days would have been from the kind of New England elite. He was the son of a doctor in Florida. Uh, and he understood that the middle classes wanted the opportunity to be able to invest and grow their capital and had no opportunity, no way to do so under the old system. And he toyed, in fairness, he toyed with the idea of trying to open it up more widely in the teens and 20s. And for one reason or another, it didn't work. But then something happened. Second World War ended, and the troops started coming home. And it's interesting that you know, the history, there, there, cult, major cultural shifts happened at the end of the Second World War in both America and Britain. In Britain, the cultural shift, was an economic shift, was very much one towards socialism. Uh, in America, there was a different shift. The year before the war ended, something that became known as the GI Bill was passed. And the effect of it, among other things, was to basically make it possible for every veteran uh, to get a university education. And what Charlie saw happening, or what Charlie saw was going to happen, was the emergence of a new, much, much wider middle class. This was going to be an educated group of professionals, many from rural areas, from working areas, who were going to go to university and who were going to wind up living a lifestyle that was very different from their parents. And they'd wind up living in communities like Levittown. It's interesting. These days, that image sort of says kind of cookie cutter or welly and banality. But this was heaven. This was a tremendous, tremendous step up. Uh, for a whole new generation of people. And he wanted to serve them, and he wanted to open up the stock market to them. Well, again, there was a tremendous elite, many firms, I'm afraid many of the firms who still sit down here, like J.P. Morgan and others, um, in, at the time felt that this was not a market to be served, not a market appropriate to be served. But Charlie disagreed, and his thundering herd of brokers uh, around the country opened up offices in small cities, uh, small and medium-sized cities that the large firms wouldn't serve. Uh, he even had a mobile uh, little wagon or van for, small, for particularly small places where people could come in, meet brokers, see the day's prices, uh, and learn more about the stock market. And what he did was probably most interesting was he, and, and this wasn't him personally, actually. It was one of his partners came up with the idea. But Merrill Lynch ran this ad, which is what everybody ought to know about this stock and bond business. It broke all the rules of advertising. It was 5,000 dense words uh, going into immense detail about the nuances of how the markets worked. And it barely said anything about Merrill Lynch. It just had some a little box in the corner saying, if you'd like information, please write to Merrill Lynch. It became potentially the most successful advertisement uh, in the history of financial services. Uh, it ran for three or four years in multiple papers across the country and completely transformed the way Americans looked at investing in the stock market. So what was the result? Well, this is what would have happened if you'd invested $100 in 1945. Now, it's easy for people with short memories to look at these periods of volatility and think, gosh, the stock market's been pretty rough on people. And it has at times, and there's no doubt about it. 
But if you'd invested $100 in 1945, you would have $90,000 today because the overall performance of a diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds through the years, particularly stocks, um, has so far outperformed almost any other public asset class. And just to be very clear, this is, this, a lot of this growth started in the 80s, but even if you look at 1945 to 1965, what you have was a tremendous rate of return, far in excess of inflation for ordinary middle class Americans. And so once again, you have an example of a new asset class being brought to a new group of people, or an old asset class, I should say, being brought to a new group of people, working out tremendously, and they in turn bringing the capital that helped fund businesses' growth and expansion across the sector. Finally, I'm going to move to about 10 years ago uh, and the market for personal lending. Uh, and I'm going to introduce you to, to three people, um, James Alexander, Richard Duval, uh, and Dave Nicholson. Uh, you're going to hear after me from one of the early members of their team and now the leader of of their company. Um, but these, these guys understood, I think, before it was a hot topic, the extent to which banking was broken. Um, they had uh, worked at and founded Egg, which was really the first online bank. And they then turned their sights in about 2004 to personal lending. And they understood that the spread for personal loans between depositors getting 1 or 2% and <coughs> borrowers borrowing at 15 or 16% made absolutely no sense. And it was the result of the traditional brick and mortar businesses of high street banks. And what they saw is a traditional negotiation term, which is called a ZOPA. And they said there's actually a much, much more sensible range in which to be doing these loans, that you can probably lend to people at about 8% uh, and have people or uh, le le lend and receive about 5%, um, have people borrow at about 8%, significantly narrow the margins. And so they started a company that most of you will now know uh, called Zopa. And it's become called peer to peer lending, a lot of terms, but it was very simply uh, a marketplace for people to lend and borrow money. Now, there were plenty of skeptics at the time. I once actually attended a lecture where somebody said that the only people, who, a Harvard Business School professor said the only people who uh, are going to borrow money on Zopa are attractive Polish women with large breasts. That was the official view of Harvard Business School. Um, <laughs> And the view particularly was, OK, in good times, interest rates will be great. But when the market goes sour, everyone's going to lose their shirt. And nobody's going to pay back through a platform like Zopa. People will pay their banks back much faster. Well, a crisis did hit about three years after Zopa launched. Uh, and bank default rates went through the roof, 5% and more, um, often much more. Based on this little graph I put together, and Giles can correct me if it's way off, but this is based on the publicly available data they put out. This is roughly what Zopa's default rates have looked like through the years, um, which is essentially no material change, constantly staying at or significantly below 2% and providing tremendous returns for the lenders who have lent through it. And so yet once again, we see an example of a market that had been controlled by an established elite that was opened up to personal, you know, ordinary individuals and became successful and productive for all of them. So finally, we move on to crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding, I should say, which is what Cedars does. Uh, we see this being the time for investing in startups to get out of the hands of the so-called elite and into the hands of the masses. That's what we're trying to do with Cedars. Thank you very much. So Jeff, you win extra bonus points for not doing the pitch about Cedars. <laughs> um, but let's talk about your day job. Wonderful. Your business. I like doing that too. What trends are you seeing? What is the crowd looking to invest in? And what kinds of startups are attracting the most attention now? It's, it's, it's a great question. So we're seeing two very interesting trends, I think, in terms of startups. One is, um, and this is not meant to just be self-serving for the talk, it's really genuine. The crowds are really smart. I mean, they, you know, they pick out businesses uh, that even when we have additional information around them one way or the other, they really suss out um, better than a lot of investors I've seen in the past what's good and what's not. Um, and they're investing in a very, very smart, very clever way. They care about valuations. They care about all sorts of things that even many, many professional institutional investors don't. So that's, that's one sort of broad trend. In terms of types of businesses, the crowdfunding we're seeing going down two sort of parallel paths. Um, one is they are investing in great 
high growth tech businesses. We are seeing businesses like Pixel Pin, like Swogo, like Digital Spin that go on to get to be part of accelerator programs or already were who were part of who, who, who were doing the kind of hot things that everyone is looking at in venture capital uh, and in early stage finance. Um, but then we're also seeing a great breed of businesses that aren't traditional venture backed businesses but still provide a great opportunity. My favorite is Mike's Fancy Cheese. Mike is a chap from Northern Ireland uh, who loves cheese. He's obsessed with cheese and he wanted to make Northern Ireland's first ever blue cheese. It doesn't exist. So he raised 80,000 pounds, largely from local Northern Irish uh, friends, family, contacts, just ordinary people who wanted to see blue cheese in Northern Ireland. Um, and businesses like that have been working very, very well for us as well. What's the average investment that people make and who are the people investing? Great question. So average ticket size is about 750 pounds, but the median ticket is about 100 pounds. So we have some much larger ones, 5, 10, 20,000 pound investments. And then we have loads and loads of 10, 20, and 50 pound. Uh, investments. And like anything, uh, the distribution of our investors is something of a bell curve. The top is very much young professionals. Uh, we have a lot of city bankers and others who perhaps would love to do a startup if they could, and this is an opportunity to be involved. But at either end, we have students who are just learning about the space now and trying it out with 10 or 20 pounds. And we have the silver surfers. We have people in their 60s and 70s and later who are fascinated by innovation, uh, have always been fascinated by innovation, have the time, have the capital, uh, and are putting in really quite significant chunks to these businesses. So here's the risk. A lot of the people who will be drawn into the growth of peer-to-peer -peer lending, of crowdfunding, don't necessarily have a knowledge base. They don't necessarily have as many wits about them as professionals. Is there not a risk that there are going to be not cedars but other newcomers who will be there to try and rip people off? Oh, it's a high-risk business. Well, that's a very good question. And I, I, first of all, I would say, as my presentation implied, that I do think most of these people have pretty strong wits about them and understand the risk profile. I mean, you know, on our platform, we do screen our investors in the sense that we put them through a quiz. We make sure that they understand the risks that they're getting into. Um, but even for platforms that don't do that, the internet is a highly transparent, highly understandable thing. Uh, and the vast majority of people that we come across actually really have a very strong sense of what they're getting into. Is there a scope for fraud in this space? Absolutely. We are among the strongest defenders of regulation. We are authorized by the FCA. We were the first equity crowdfunding platform anywhere in the world to get regulatory approval. And we think it is very important that there be an appropriate level of supervision by regulators and that the media and others hold us to account because there are cowboys in any industry. Uh, and just as anybody would be concerned about them in their industry, we're concerned about them in ours. All right. Well, good luck and thanks for sharing your story. Thank Jeff you Lynn. very much, David.